Good day and welcome and I'm really fortunate at the moment to have my sister Linda along with me staying um, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to have a chat with her today because Linda actually specialises in behavioural change in a, a slightly different setting um, to the stuff around lean change and so Linda would you like to just tell us what you actually do for your job? Okay so I'm from England and I work for a local authority um, my role is uh, as a community development officer, but I'm also the training lead uh, for our team. And our team focuses very much on helping people to stay as independent as they can, um, primarily around their health and well-being, with a large amount of our work focused with older people. Mm -hmm. um, so in England, I work in Portsmouth, um, which is a large city and uh, city which has the highest levels of health inequalities and uh, deprivation so lots of the work that the local authority does is around supporting those people in their communities to access um, information and opportunities to maximize their health and well-being fantastic so from what I understand we have some similarities in what we do in our role because you actually help with behavioural change. So maybe you can tell us a bit about what what your experience of um, helping people make changes in their behaviour which will obviously then contribute to their wellbeing. Um, I guess that approach is all about starting where people are at. As a service we work in a very person-centred way. So in terms of working with people, we're led by people and we start with their needs first. Um, in terms of behaviour change, um, I guess the type of behaviour change model that we're working with is underpinned by philosophies and principles, but fundamentally it's about understanding human behaviour. Um, and I work with professionals, but also people who work in the voluntary sector um, and independent sector around supporting ways of working with people that enable people to um, reflect and understand and reach insight for themselves, which helps them improve their own health and well-being. Mm. So one of the models that we use focuses very much on that insights piece that then helps create options. So is that something that you would do with individuals as well? Um, I guess key to the approach is about... Um, empowering people um, and helping people to reflect on where they're at at the moment and where they'd like to be. I guess it's easy to say that if the people that you're working with are at a point at which they recognise that, but often people don't. Um, so I would say the approach is very much like what we're doing now. It's about having a conversation with people, um, helping them to identify what their needs are and then working with them around supporting them with information, um, opportunities to access both services but community-based um, projects to help them gain the skills and the knowledge to be able to make the changes that they want to make for themselves. Mm -hmm. I guess that's key to it. Um, the change needs to be identified and driven by the person themselves it's not about us imposing what we feel is right for them mm, mm, mm. so it's about involving it's about meeting where they're at and it's about taking that almost coaching approach to helping them come up with their own solutions and then supporting them with that yeah and I guess key to that is about understanding the, the starting point is about understanding what's important to them um, often in clinical settings people will be referred to services where the health professional feels that a change needs to take place for the person's health to improve. However, for the person, that might not even be on their radar. Mm. So I guess as professionals, it's, it's about us not making assumptions and it's about checking out with the person what's important to them. Mm. For example, if a person is referred to a smoking cessation um, intervention, they may have been referred because a health professional has identified that smoking is a risk factor for them. 
However, for them, in their lifestyle, the smoking may not be an issue at all. They may not feel that it's an issue, but they may have other surrounding issues that, which we would call the wider determinants of health. Mm. For example, they may be struggling with um, debt. They may be in poor housing. They may have other issues in their lives which are linked to um, alcohol misuse. So you can see just from that description that there might be many facets for that person that affect their health and well-being. Um, and it's about working with their, that person to find out what's the most important thing to them. Mm. Mm. So whilst they may have been referred for smoking cessation, we may have to work on the debt management or the housing issues that they have to be able to eventually come back and address the smoking issue, which is obviously the health-related issue that the person's been referred to. Mm. Mm. So that's about taking a holistic view of where the person's at, not just trying to impose a solution based on the perceived need, but actually really understanding what's going on for that individual. Yeah. Yeah. So final question then, in your role, what would you say is the key skill that you need to be able to do your role well? Um, the key skill, I think, is around doing what we're doing. It's having a conversation with the person it's enabling them to talk in a way of which they present cues and by that we mean that they actually invite you into the conversation so they're bringing up what they want to discuss and you go with that to be able to get a broader picture of what their life is like mm. and how a particular health issue or a social issue fits within that whole lifestyle um, and we talked very much about importance a moment ago. Um, I would suggest that whilst in, importance is a real key thing in helping someone along the journey of uh, improving their health and well-being, at the same time we also need to explore confidence along the side of that. For example, if somebody is chatting with me about something um, and we may have had a discussion about how important it is for them to make that change around that particular topic area. Um, as a professional, what I also need to be aware of and check out with them is how confident they feel about making that change. Mm -hmm. um, and often when we're delivering services, we forget to check out confidence. For example, it may be really important for a person to make a change in a certain direction. But if we don't check out the confidence they have to be able to make that change, then really we're setting that person up um, for a fall, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as you will know, in your training, um, we have a strategy called scaling questions. Mm -hmm. So on a one scale of one to 10, how do you feel about something? So we may use that uh, strategy and we may ask someone around importance, how important it is for them to make the change. Well, they may say, for example, that it's a seven, that you know they really feel ready and they want to make the change. Now, as a professional, I could think, that's really great, we're at a point now at which we can take action. But that's me as a professional leading the change. What I need to then do is go back to the person and say, OK, you've told me it's a seven, so it sounds like it's fairly important for you to make the change. How confident do you feel that you're going to be able to make that change? Now, they may come back to me and they may say, well, they only feel a two at confidence. Mm. So as you can see from that example, a change may be really important to somebody, but if they don't feel they have the confidence to make that change, then the likelihood of that change taking place is diminished. Mm. So what we then need to do is go back and we need to reflect on the confidence aspect of it. And we might say, OK, so you're saying a two for confidence. What would make that say, what would need to happen for that to be a three or a four? So as you can see there, the importance then becomes a sort of uh, in a neutral holding position mm. because we need to work on the confidence for them to be able to achieve the change that they feel is important. Mm. Mm. And I guess that's about the conversation 
when we meet again, or we may not meet again. In my role, I may only have one conversation with somebody, but we always need to be revisiting confidence alongside importance. Yes. Yeah, because that's going to then impact their ability and their motivation to actually do something about it. Yeah. So um, it sounds as though there are lots of parallels with what we do in lean change and coaching and what you're doing in, in your professional role as well, which is around health and well-being. So you, from what you said there, it sounds as though um, when we're in organisations, we take that importance and we, we run with that. And sometimes we need to also be cognizant of the confidence that an organisation may really rate something as a 10 on importance, but actually there might be parts of the organisation that are not feeling so confident about delivering that. Um, and so that then stops them taking action. Yeah. And yeah. I guess for me, um, that also comes back to what we said about earlier. The, you know, the person-centred approach is very much about um, identifying the individual um, and what tends to happen in organisations um, is that organisational change needs to happen for business reasons and is very much driven by business reasons. And what sometimes gets forgotten is that those people that provide that business also need to feel enabled, I would say, be part of that process of change mm -hmm. at the beginning. Mm -hmm for them to be able to feel that they have a part in it or feel that they have the confidence to actually carry out whatever the change is and how that affects them as individuals, mm. not just in the role that they do, but as individuals within their own right. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thanks very much for sharing that with us. So just to bring this into sort of the the change the organizational change piece and where the world is going we're moving more into the world of individualized services and what you've talked about there Linda is very much about that individual approach and that will become more and more prevalent as we move into the world of technology and organizations applying a sort of cookie cutter approach to change maybe need to rethink how they individualize that change approach to actually work with those individuals and understand the, the sort of the relative confidence in the organisation. So there you have it, a, a, a longer than a usual conversation today. I just wanted to share that because we've been talking about our different roles and I thought it would be useful to you, for you to hear a different perspective and maybe think about how you could then apply some of what Linda's been saying today into your organisation around change. So thanks for joining me again and next time I will be doing another book review so stay tuned.